So really a warm welcome to you. Uh, and I was just saying we can still, we have four more days or a few more days to say Happy New Year. So Happy New Year to all of you. Hope it's a gentler um, and healthy and productive and enjoyable year in many ways for you. Um, so warm welcome to our participants uh, from afar and from, from UCL, from the Bartlett. We're gathered uh, here today to discuss what is a really an urgent and multi-layered issue, which in principle underpins all of our work at the university, and that's the question of ethics. But I want to invite us to do so through a particular lens, and that's the disciplinary lens of the built environment field. And then also with a particular attentiveness to the dynamics of international engagement at the heart of ethical practice. So before we delve into this question and to give you a little bit of context for this particular angle, I'd like to um, introduce you to the, the webinar series within which this, this, um, this seminar, this particular seminar is located. And this is a webinar series entitled Bartlett's Publics Pluralizing, which I am curating in my role as Vice Dean International at uh, Bartlett. And with the wonderful support of my colleague, Dr. Yulia Wesley, who is also present here today. So this webinar theory is one of the mechanisms through which the Bartlett we're seeking to reflect on and to revisit, to sharpen our principles of international engagement. And this is a task made particularly urgent in a post-COVID-19 context and as the urgencies of the multiple and intersect intersecting global uh, crisis become increasingly pressing, including, of course, a reflection on, on the role of the built environments uh, within, these within these crises. And it would be remiss also not to mention the context of important shifts in the higher education sector in the United Kingdom post-Brexit, but also globally. So two broad principles underpin this review. The first one is a reaffirmation of the public role of the university as a progressive actor in shaping more socio-environmentally just and caring development trajectories. And this is a call to review pr principles of international engagement that can enhance and buttress the Bartlett's and other universities public role and relevance. And I want to make a little aparte here. We had we discussed some of the ideas um, in a first webinar of this series that was developed in the context of the Development Studies Association annual conference in June 2022. We're going to put the link in the chat, and I invite you to have a look at this uh, conversation. We had inputs from Brazil, India, Lebanon, and South Africa, and some of the speakers are here, and we'll be able, no doubt, to refer to it or, or, or continue the conversation, make the links between the two conversations. The second principle is the need to develop this review as a locally and globally networked endeavor, that is, in discussion with the Bartlett's diverse community of staff and students, but also, and crucially, in dialogue with our international interlocutors and partners, ranging from other universities and knowledge institutions to um, multilateral organizations, engaged communities of practice, etc., state and private bodies. And this is both because urban challenges, um, including growing inequalities, the climate breakdown, or the impact of digital um, revolution, are increasingly global in nature and therefore require response, responses at multiple scales within a solidarity perspective. But because also the unequal political economy of accessing and producing knowledge to tackle these challenges requires unsettling through local, global, local alliances. And it is where the notion of practicing ethics in international engagement, whether it's in education, research, or public engagements, becomes central. And we have, of course, all we all have institutional guidelines to help us think through our ethical practices. But we've all experienced also in our work the limitations of these guidelines in helping us to think through critical questions of who we're engaging with, for what purposes, and on what terms. And especially if we add the consideration of international engagement into the mix, um, these issues become all the more critical and difficult and therefore require reflexivity. So we've created here a short Mentimeter 
to understand what practicing ethics and interna international engagement means for you. This is going to be a, a useful basing point for our discussion today. So Julia has uh, put this slide here. I hope you can, you're familiar with Mentimeter. Um, Okay, so the responses that we have uh, so far is about uh, practicing ethics that is people-centered, that is addressing north-south power dynamics, that is not extracting. Um, people saying it means to be able to address different professional values and ethical principles to enable synergies, uh, which I think is a lot to, to unpack here that definitely our speakers would talk about. Requiring the acknowledgement of a particular set of power relations. Um, Cultural, being culturally appropriate, um, thinking about nonlinear, iterative, reflexive processes of trying to do right by our participants and ourselves in our research, the researcher being true to data, being fair with no harm, which is, I think, an interesting twist on the benefit no harm uh, notion. So mm -hmm. I think there's some really interesting aspects coming up that for sure we were going to, um, yeah, many of our speakers are going to pick up. Uh, it's listening, being an interlocutor between institutions, non-extractive and acknowledging knowledges as equal, understanding slow violence of bureaucracies. And I think the in institutional dimension and that uh, will, will come up definitely. I'm looking forward to that discussion. Um, complex, it means overall developing relationships based on mutual respect. But in practice, that means allowing time and space for significant levels of collaboration with major implications for budgets, projects, plans, mm -hmm. and ethics so, as a process rather than a one-off application. Thanks so much, Julia. There's, there's a lot there, and we will make all of this available in post-webinar uh, uh, communication. So these are really important, and obviously they're touching on a lot of the issues that we're going to be addressing today, both sort of generic and some quite practical ones too, which I think is really interesting. Two uh, questions underpin our discussions today. Sorry, not underpin, but our two two are motivating. The, sorry, two questions are essential to our discussion today. One is how can we co-construct ethical principles and practices in international engagement that contribute to addressing systemic inequalities? So we are starting from the premise that there are systemic inequalities in engagement. And the second is this practical dimension, which is also really important for us because we are trying, we are using these spaces in a way as advocacy, advocacy spaces for our institutions, for changing practices with our institutions. So that second question is what are the levers of change that we can individually and collectively push to expand our ethical practices in and through our teaching, learning, research, and public engagement. So to help think through these questions and to help start sketching the context, the contours of a more ethical practices, it's my really great pleasure to um, welcome our four panelists today. I'll present them in turn and they will all each um, uh, do a sort of seven, eight minute presentation. Um, the idea being that we have plenty of time left for a conversation amongst ourselves. Um, this is really, uh, as I said, want, we want this to be a reflexive space and a space for thinking collectively how we can um, uh, change things together. Um, this is a recorded uh, discussion. It will be uploaded on the Bartlett website and I'll give a bit more information later on to the follow-up activities that we seek to develop connected to, these, uh, to this panel and to the panel series more generally. So if ever you would prefer to have your input anonymized, please send me an email and we'll find a way of either cutting it or changing it so that uh, your input is anonymized. Before starting to introduce uh, the panelists in turn, I want to, to say my, my sadness that we will not be joined by Professor Maman Tijani Alou uh, from Niamey University. Uh, We've tried and tried, and uh, it's become increasingly evident that we were not going to be able to have secure enough or stable enough an internet connection to have his input uh, for this kind of webinar series. And in itself is very talkative of the kind of inequalities in international engagement that we talk about and the difficulties of creating if we want a truly international uh, scholarship, community of scholarship. 
Um, so, so I will find a way of getting his insights into the conversation. I think I will try and find a way of interviewing him in a different way um, so that we can learn from him because I wanted him to share, of course, some of the difficulties of the context within which he's operating, the experiences of international engagement he has, but also to share the really interesting experience uh, that comes from this uh, Lasdell Laboratory, which is a laboratory of studies and research on social dynamics and local development, uh, which um, he led from 2001 to 2007. And this is a really fascinating Western Africa, sort of uh, regional Sahel region um, uh, research institute, practice-oriented research institute that has really path-breaking insights. And uh, it would be really important to know how they managed to, to engage internationally in, in, in their work. But to start with, we have, I'm delighted to introduce Professor Jane Randall, who is Professor of Critical Spatial Practice at the Bartlett School of Architecture at UCL, where she co-developed the Practicing Ethics website with Dr. David Roberts and Dr. Yael Padan as part of the Bartlett Ethics Commission and also the Knowledge in Action for Urban Equality or NO program. The, the website uh, practicingethics.org, which we're going to put in the uh, chat just shortly, hosts numerous resources, principles, protocols, processes, and practices um, for built environment academics and practitioners. And it won a Reba President's Award for Research, Ethics and Education in 2021. So I really warmly invite you to go and have a look at it and, and, um, and, and sort of see what you can learn from it and also exchange with it. So her research crosses architecture, art, fem feminism, history and psychoanalysis. So I'm delighted uh, to welcome Jane. Jane, please, um, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Barbara, for this uh, wonderful invitation to participate in this important discussion that you're that you're leading and hosting. So I'm very happy to be here. Hi, hi to everyone who's joined us. Um, if I may, I will just begin to screen share. I have a few slides to accompany my uh, presentation. So I'm just going to put that up there. Is that clear for everyone? Okay. Hi. Okay. Hi. So. Um, I'm going to, my talk is called Practicing Ethics, and it um, engages the idea of the ethical hotspot and the ethical touchstone. Um, it's a little bit of a story of the development of a practice of ethics, and so I hope you'll bear with me through the narration, um, and we'll get to a, a very much a shared point at the end. So on the 11th of June, 2011, a handshake occurred between Malcolm Grant, the then provost of UCL, and Andrew McKenzie, the then CEO of BHB Billiton. The handshake sealed the deal for UCL's decision to accept $10 million of charitable funding from the Anglo-Australian multinational mining and then petroleum company to create an energy policy uh, Institute in Adelaide, Australia, and the Institute for Sustainable Resources in London at the Bartlett Faculty of the Built Environment. I was Vice Dean of Research for the Bartlett at the time, and as part of UCL's risk register, I was asked to assess the risks of research expansion. In my view, although it expanded the research capacity of the Bartlett, the new relationship between UCL and BHP Billiton posed a conflict of interest and thus a potential reputational risk. How, I wondered, could independent research on sustainability be funded by profits, even when dispersed through a charitable arm gained from mining fossil fuels? What kind of governance structures and, di and dilig due diligence procedures could protect the independence of academic research? Could this gift potentially allow BHP Billiton to buy legitimacy for the continued mining of fossil fuels, or what is called the social license to operate, maybe a phrase that we, we will come back to. I spoke to a number of people and encountered a whole range of views on this topic. Some argued that universities must engage with businesses in order to change them. Others argued that it's not where the money comes from, it's what you do with it that matters. 
In my own view, BHP Bulletin's activities did appear to conflict with a number of key UCL principles and procedures as they were expressed at the time in four documents, UCL's research strategy, its environmental strategy, its research ethics framework, and its guidelines for the acceptance of gifts and donations. And so I judged the risk of potential damage to reputation to be significant enough to warrant personally purchasing a copy of a report by a company called Rep Risk on BHP Bulletin, which I later shared with UCL. Rep Risk describes their Rep Risk Index as a quantitative risk measure that captures criticism and quantifies a company's or project's exposure to controversial environmental, social and governance issues. The risk report showed BHP Bulletin's degree of exposure to four issues, environmental footprint, community relations, employee relations and corporate governance. I wasn't able to live with the contradictions and decided to stand down from my role as Vice Dean of Research. The process began my long interest now in the relationship between ethics and governance, both through my individual site writing and books such as Silver and my institutional work with others. It should be added importantly, that UCL swiftly made changes to the process for accepting charitable funding by involving what's called ESG, Environment Social Governance Due Diligence, and in October 29, did decide to divest from fossil fuels. The collaborative work that I began on, on ethical practice started with a Bartlett funded year long project, Practicing Ethics, which examined ethics in built environment research and it ended with an international conference. So important to note here that the Bartlett was very much engaged in wanting to support this, this question of ethics and governance and did support the early phase of this project. The project then developed into something called the Bartlett Ethics Commission and the Bartlett Ethics Working Group, in which with representatives from across the faculty, some of whom are here today, um, and across the university in, in more broadly, we engaged practically with UCL's review of its own ethics procedures, and those are the ethics procedures um, for, for researchers. We hosted a whole series of events, most of them in collaboration with others. So Rich Seams Dark Pools was hosted with UCL Urban Lab and focused on ethical issues connected with sustainability, research and fossil fuels. And it had to take place under something called Chatham House Rules so that managers, administrators, as well as staff and students could speak frankly outside their institutional roles. And these conversations led to a pan UCL debate with medics and lawyers, work with the student led campaign fossil free, and finally a vote on fossil fuel divestment at UCL's academic board. And for another conference speech extractions co organized with Deanna Salazar, the Colombian solidarity campaign and the London night mining network communities from Colombia, Indonesia and Brazil all directly affected by mines co-owned by BH Billiton were invited to UCL as part of a visit to BHP Billiton's AGM to share their experiences. And this was a incredibly um, moving event. Um, I can talk about it more in the, in the Q&A if you're interested. As a result of this work, I was invited to join No, which Barbara's uh, earlier introduced, an ESRC funded project led by Professor Karen Levy and involving key members of the Bartlett uh, Development Planning Unit and many others who are here today. Hi, Professor Convey. Um, you are also a really important person in, in that project. Um, and I was invited to lead a particular piece of work called the Ethics of Research Practice. Working with me, Dr. Yale Padan examined the Western centric bias of many ethical values and terms that stem from enlightenment thinking and the power dynamics that privilege the individual over the communal group or collective and, and value certain cultures over others. 
With Bartlett Ethics Fellow, Dr. David Roberts, and derived from his work on self-questioning as a form of ethical guidance, this website, which David designed and produced, contains the work of over 30 collaborators internationally. It comprises a lexicon of ethical principles, a set of ethical guides, several ethical case studies, and commentary on uh, key ethical protocols, as well as a um, range of reading lists. The project explores how ethics navigates between universal principles and institutional codes on the one hand, and lived and situated experience on the other. Ethical practice is a process of negotiating relations between selves and others, where the mess of everyday life encounters institutional principles, codes, and procedures which govern us. Researchers Grelimin and Gillam would describe the handshake that I began my talk with as an ethically important moment, a starting point for raising ethical awareness, something that I describe as a hotspot. Through the embodied process of critical reflection that follows, ethical practice emerges. And in his work on governance and ethics, the French philosopher Michel Foucault has a term, technologies of the self, which explores the techniques and practices through which subjects establish their relation to others and to moral codes and norms. In Foucault's lectures on Parisia, part of his ethics work and the practice of truth speaking, he refers to the Greek term basonos. This touchstone tests the degree of accord between a person's life and the principle of intelligibility or logos through which they account for their actions. Practicing ethics is the ongoing work of balancing bios or the acts that comprise a person's life with logos or the words that express a principle of intelligibility. While a hotspot could be a solitary experience of ethical awareness, touchstones highlight contact, exploring how ethics is what takes place between us. We'll be exploring these terms further with others through a set of commissioned case studies in our forthcoming book, Practicing Ethics, co a co-edited volume. And some of the contributors are here today. It's very nice to see them and working through these, these core terms in the practicing ethic process. Institutionally, my hope is that we can find ways of connecting three different types of ethical practice. Ethical practice as a research topic, ethical practice as a way of doing pedagogy, research and practice, and ethical practice as the processes and structures through which research institutions govern themselves. So I want to end with this, I find quite inspiring diagram for, from UNESCO's paper, Education for Sustainable Development Goals, which describes what they call a whole institution approach, a model for how these different kinds of ethical practice could be explored together in a university setting. So this describes sustainable development education, but I'm suggesting that it's something that we could use in a very um, a translational way to think about how ethical practices, these different kinds of ethical practice might come together in this whole institution approach, which would be quite a holistic approach and also very much uh, fit with um, what is called constructional in constructive institutional critique in art practice. So I come from um, art and architecture humanities field. I'm not a development uh, planning uh, scholar or practitioner. And in the art field, the term constructive institutional critique describes a little bit what I've talked through today, which is the idea of intervening into a structure in order to, to make transformational change with others that is constructive and aims for um, better futures. So thank you very much. Jane, thank you so much for, for this. Um really interesting and thought-provoking uh, introductory input. Um, it's really helpful, I think, for all of us to get a sense of the ways in which quite concretely these issues of ethics 
are brought up in institutions. So the question are, you know, and in particular, I mean, often they're thought in terms of reputation, reputational damage. Um, and it's amazing to see the kind of campaign that you managed to foster around this in the context of BHP Billiton funding for USL, for UCL, sorry. Um, but also very interesting to hear from your research within No and in other contexts, the ways in which you'll be you're thinking of unpacking the notion of ethical practices and in different sectors, whether that's in pedagogy, uh, research practice, processes and structures through which research institutions govern themselves. So this is really opening up for us, I think, a really nice broad um, sense of the terrain within which we're having this conversation. So our next speaker is uh, Professor um, Wilbard Kombe, and I'm delighted that he can join us and really thankful that he can join us um, at, a, at a bit of a short uh, notice. Uh, professor Kombe is a professor of urban land management at the Institute of Human Settlement Studies at Adi University in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. Um, he, his research focuses on land management, on governance of informal urbanization, governance of water and sanitation in peri-urban areas. Uh, Professor Kombi has led many multidisciplinary research activities in collaboration with several international university partners, including UCL. So uh, many of us here on this panel have been very lucky to work with Professor Kombi in different contexts, in different moments. Um, he's also worked with the University of Agriculture in Stockholm, the Technical University Dortmund in Germany, and the University of Copenhagen. Moreover, he has extensive international experience consulting with UN Habitat, the World Bank, Danish International Development Agency, CEDA, and others. And I think he's also going to be tell, talking to us about the work uh, being developed uh, in the context of a Pan-African uh, project, which is the um, Associate, African Association of APS of planning, you're going to help me. I can never go beyond the acronym. So Professor Combe, you're going to help me uh, unpack AAPS. Um, looking forward to your input. Thank you. Thank you so much, Barbara, for inviting me to participate in this discussion. Thank you, Jane, for setting the scene. And a long time we've not met since our North period. And I'm very glad to be involved because of my personal experience in different areas in teaching, research, and collaboration with colleagues from within the country and outside the country. And therefore, I will not take a lot of time, but I'll touch upon some of the issues which have concerned me as I've been collaborating, both in terms of the, from the NO project and from the overdue project we happen to be doing now, and raising some of the concerns which have given me enlightenment in terms of further understanding of the ethical concerns, which I must admit, before we engaged in no, my understanding was very much limited to the ABCs, like all other colleagues in my university and researchers, the normal ABC of research methodology, plagiarism, and uh, uh, misinterpretation of data, uh, 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 disregard of acknowledgement of others' work, and, 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 and not really looking into the hard issues of of plagiarism, especially those which concerns the community you are you are you are investigating, you are analyzing, you are researching, and uh, being fair and just to the community is very important. Mm -hmm. And also, this touches my experience in the policy area where I've been involved in supporting the government to prepare policy programs. In terms of the of the my experience from from the NO, and especially when I try to review the curriculum in my MSc and PhD uh, courses at, at, at the university, there are quite a lot of challenges. People not really appreciating what are you going to add in terms of the, in terms of the, in terms of the ethical practice and, and knowledge, which you, you think the, st the student need beyond what is contained in the research policy of the university. And uh, I was able, and I benefited a lot from the Jane uh, 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 publications and some of the documents which you derive from now to try to add in the Senate and try to add the colleagues that this is a very important area and it goes beyond the academic publications of individual staff members. And it goes beyond the really the measurement which university uses to assess the excellence of individual staff. 
and I try to focus very much on the society implications, being care of the society, benefit, benefit the society, and going back to the, the sharing knowledge and seeing knowledge as a co-produced output. And that was one of the major focuses of the No Project, that knowledge is essentially a co-produced output. It's not the a domain of the researchers and academics. It's actually academics take the knowledge from society, they blend it with it, some experience and some other ways, and probably they bring a new knowledge to the ground, but essentially it's all produced the output. This was a really uh, an important thing, which eventually I, we organized a workshop with the university and the research workshop, where I presented some of the ideas which emanate from this thinking of the ethical ethics in research methodology, as well as in, in, in practice, as well as ethics in, uh, in, in, in scientific work. And this is one of the experience. One of the major, uh, major observations which I drew from this uh, experience is that there is very little knowledge among colleagues and peers about what ethical practice and knowledge is. There is a very narrow understanding. And as a result, as you cooperate with the colleagues from the special African countries where the coverage on this issue are very narrow, you may realize that you are not on the operating on the same platform. Therefore, the issue of uh, development of uh, platforms and relationship of eco partners and and the eco eco partners working the eco towards eco eco out, outcome is not that much apparent. Mm -hmm. And therefore, in my opinion, there is a need from the very beginning to set a common ground for understanding ethical practice and principles and the defining the ethical parameters which research projects and the, and the studies which are, are, are undertaken through international partnership aim to achieve. In my opinion, this is one of the major lessons which I saw from the, from the, from the discussion which we had at the university. And secondly, I think the critical discussion of setting a, an ethical environment in a university which goes beyond the academia is a challenge which is an ongoing and which will continue for many years to come. In the sense that appreciation of the ethical principle and practice going beyond the academic excellence of publication is an issue which remains to be addressed and to be accepted across the, the, the structures and decision-making processes. And this raises the question of the epistemological justice which we often researchers do not take seriously. And that's what I mentioned at the beginning, that we blame the knowledge we get from societies, our knowledge contribution. And this is really a challenge which we, we are still to, to, to reflect upon. And uh, finally, I wish to emphasize also that in policy making, recently I was involved in another project. We are involved in another project with Adriana here. And we are trying to review the bylaws which are being applied in the informal settlements here in Mwanza in terms of managing the sanitation systems. And in the process, we are trying to respond with looking at the existing bylaws, lessons from what we've drawn, we've drawn from our research here and seeing what can be done to assist the low-income households on a very difficult terrain and precarious living conditions because of poor sanitation and seeing what can we do to assist them. And we have had a uh, debate which has been, today we had a hot debate between professionals, between the city and municipal officials, between health workers, between, between, between lawyers, uh, all of them purport, uh, trying to emphasize that we need stringent laws to control to make sure that these people on the hills of Mwanza are, are, have, sanita have, have decent sanitation, but without, without considering their ability to afford and without considering their precarious socioeconomic condition. And this is really to me was another eye opener which tells that, which shows us that as academic and researchers, often we make mistakes and the mistakes we make can cost people many, many lives in, in, in some, some extent, as also make condition of those living in very poor condition poor by stringent introduction of laws and regulations. This takes me to the second issue, which I concern the how African schools are trying to address the issue of ethical practices and, and, <coughs> and principles. In 1999, a number of African schools, which happened, I also happened to be 
my investor happened to be one of them, uh, establishing Association of African Planning Schools. This is a forum of African schools, which was established with a very clear intention to try to critically reflect as a think tank for critically reflecting upon the planning system, including laws which were inherited from the colonial uh, masters or colonial administrators. And the idea include looking at the laws and regulations, looking to the planning curriculum and trying to see whether it really addresses the realities of African context and kind of creating a platform where you can exchange experiences, you can change, you can exchange uh, knowledge and you can also critique ideas and thinking which have been used to, which have been rubber stamped in many African countries from the 1940s, 40s, the British uh, planning law, especially. And this was a very important uh, engagement because I remember the late the, the, the Vanessa Watson was one of the pioneers of this discussion. And he went to all over schools in Sub-Saharan Africa, trying to convince them this, this was an important inspiration. And in the beginning, we got some money from the Rockefeller Foundation for support in the program of negotiation, discussion, and review of the curriculum. And what I'm trying to say is that uh, from this association of African schools or planning schools, a lot of issues have come to the surface. We've been able to share a lot of knowledge which do not exist in many schools. And of course, South Africa is far more ahead in terms of thinking, in terms of research, in terms of conceptualization of African planning systems than any of our schools in the, in the region. And this has been a very important, therefore, a kind of lever for learning from other colleagues, including from research we have been undertaken. And from this, we have been able to review the curriculum, which are making a difference in terms of really trying to do away with those uh, one size fit all concepts, which are embedded in the British planning system, which was put in place in the, during the colonial period. And therefore, what I'm trying to emphasize is that limited exposure of the academics cannot be done cannot be addressed without collaboration, without partnership, both partnership within the region and with the external uh, uh, partners like what we are partnering with the USA, I mean, with the, with the, with the UK institutions, including TPU. And in order to create this uh, long lasting legacy, we need to go beyond the academic publication. We need to go beyond the assessment of output from a research from the perspective of the publication which we have. And my understanding is that the research which we engage in now and this one which we are undertaking in overdue in Mwanza have, have gone beyond, have stretched, have stretched the questions, research questions beyond the, beyond the theoretical, beyond the academic ideas and it's, they are very much based on the lines of the action research, meaning practical problem are you solving and how are you assisting the society which you're investigating to do away some of the challenges they are facing. Basically, those were my observation and I wish to thank you again so much, but I have two challenges which I want to raise before I conclude my, my, my presentation, my discussion. There is, a, as I said, there is, a, there is a narrow, there is a gap between intellectual curiosity and ethical concerns. Many of our colleagues, ourselves, are very much concerned about the intellectual curiosity and publication. And therefore, there is a widening gap between uh, uh, interest, this, this intellectual curiosity and interest and ethic, or on ethical concerns, practice and principles. And my question is, how do we turn around this very strong legacy, which is actually also and one of the outcome of the colonial inheritance in the country. The other question which I want to raise is also that, can the relatively insensitive and uh, 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 political economy or tab uh, 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 turbulent political economy of, uh, of the young democracies like Tanzania provide a responsive platform for ethical practice and principles? Can this relationship, which is very, very asymmetric between the, the academic, the political, and the practitioners, the relationship is very asymmetric. 
meaning that often the politics have a stronger power, even the evidence-based discussions. Can such an environment provide an adequate platform for exercising ethical principles and practices? Thank you very much for listening. Barbara, you unmute. Sorry, I was muted. Um, thank you so much, Professor Kombe, for these really interesting points that you raise. And in particular, the last point is I know something that um, uh, Professor Maman um, Tijalu wanted to raise also in the context of Niamey. So a really interesting debate here uh, in terms of, of how would you say? I mean, it's, it's a question that is that arises in many contexts, but is particularly acute in some, which is that question of, of how does, does the university also um, retain its public role in a context of scarcity of resources and where pressures around having a public voice are particularly strong. Um, so, and, and this is where international alliances might be really helpful. So I think there's a, a really important discussion to be had around the way in which we can create, uh, if you want a more internationalist community of practice to support each other in our different contexts in order to uphold an ethical practice and a particular uh, public notion of the role of the university in, in the public debate and public domain. So thank you so much for bringing that up because I think we really need to think about that in a networked fashion. Um, and, and you raised some really important ways actually in which we need to develop situated understanding of ethics, but that this situated understanding of ethics is actually uh, always sharpened and 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 made more pertinent through international discussions. So I think this is also a really important tension point here that we need to think about, and we need to think about how we can support this this um, collective way of thinking that nonetheless enables situated and localized responses. So thank you so much for putting all these issues onto the agenda. We're now going to turn to a more research focused discussion on questions of ethics through the input of our next panelist, Dr. Maha Shuaib. Uh, she is the British Academy Bilateral Chair in Conflict and Director of the Center for Lebanese Studies at the Faculty of Education, University of Cambridge. She co-founded the Lebanese Association for History and the Disability Research and Advocacy Hub, which are housed at the Center for Lebanese Studies. Both initiatives aim to create collectives that bring together academics, practitioners, and policymakers to work together on these themes. So Maha, um, we look forward to hearing your input. Thank you very much, Barbara, Hi, everyone. Um, so, um, I mean, I'm there's a lot of what I wanted to say that has been partly said, but I want to focus my intervention on three main points. One, institutions, two, partnerships and funding, and three, what we can do as collectives. And I think these are, I, I hope they will respond to the three main questions that uh, you have put in uh, for us. Um, so just first to talk a little bit about uh, because what I come, my positionality matters a lot in this discussion because so as an academic who uh, uh, kept moving between the global north and the global south and you know using them in uh, um, you know for the sake of this conversation in terms of the geographical um, so as a director of the Center for Many Studies which is a research center in England but also in Lebanon and as an academic moving between University of Cambridge and uh, CLS at LAU you know we we couldn't help but you know, face these research ethics directly um, and experience them differently when you're in the global north and when you're in the global south. And I think this is how we started also to, to engage with these questions. A lot of what I will share today is, is also um, not something that I have only uh, discussed and thought about alone. At the center, we've really um, started discussing and unpacking many of these issues because we were very frustrated with how research ethics, the institutional uh, way of, of working on them, were very frustrating for us as researchers and were, were actually not very ethical for many of our researchers on the ground. So let me start with institutions. I mean, 
Um, uh, yes, I just want to also mention a lot of what I'm sharing today, we have already worked on in uh, part of the British Academy, we're doing workshops on research ethics for uh, scholars. Now, unfortunately, when we advertise for these spaces, we only get students. Uh, because academics uh, and staff think that they are not concerned with it and they think that they've done this and they've ticked this box. So, you know, even at the faculty when I say, oh, the yes, the students would like to attend this. I said, like, no, I actually would like for us as staff to, because we have a lot of work to do in this uh, uh, in this field. So, um, and my colleague, Maya Bumagali, who's, uh, who's also with me uh, uh, amongst the participants who worked a lot on this uh, theme together. So let me start with the institution. So whether in, you are in the UK or you are part of the Lebanese American University in Beirut, which where we are embedded, uh, we have different IRBs or different ethical um, boards and systems. Um, I think the one in, in Lebanon is very much, um, um, you know, not restricted to social sciences. Um, but I think from our experience, these ethical procedures, as we learn them as students and we practice them as researchers, for us, we felt that they're about protecting the institutions. They're not about protecting the participants or the collaboration, or they're not even concerned with the kind of partnerships or the relational aspects that happens as long as we uh, you know, can um, do the anonymous and the confidential aspect you can get away with lots of things. Um, and this reductionist understanding of research ethics is what really made us want to talk about this because we felt all of the issues that were being raised daily by our researchers were completely uh, unexamined and un uncovered by this um, these institutions. And they're not interested to hear about this conversation. Um, um, I think staff and academics and scholars are beginning to work on this and, and in my faculty we started to revise some of these things we're still we have a long way we're moving beyond just you know for many people it's still anonymous and confidentiality is is the most important uh, two most important criteria uh, and the relational aspect is still not that important but we're beginning to start the conversation just before i joined the call i was filling a form uh, an evaluation by a donor asking me what did i think of the quality of the partnership that uh, we were having with another uh, or research institute in the global north um interestingly the word ethics was never you know, it didn't come out part of the partnerships, but I think that's why I think it's a very important thing. So just to conclude this part about institutions, there is a need for very serious conversation about the way we fill these forms, what do these forms mean, how we can transform them, and I think we have an obligation towards the starting this process and um, working on it. I think uh, research ethics training, and I, I hope, I, I would imagine that we have lots of students and uh, early career scholars who could also share their experience about how they fill this form and how and what training and, and uh, knowledge and discussion happens around this topic. The second point I want to raise, which is partnerships. It's, it's hardly ever a component of research ethics. Research ethics is, is just, you know, when you go for the field work. And even, you know, Michael, my colleague may always problematize this work, like we have to stop calling this field work. These are where people live and these are people's livelihoods. And I think she's very right. Um, so partnerships, this, this extractive way of collaborating, that is not ethical. The extractive way of collecting data and building our career, that is not ethical. This all comes under ethics. Whose questions? Um, get to be asked and why and why this methodology and you know why this sample why this population why this location these are all part of the research ethics questions that we need to respond to and we need to address unfortunately they're not part of the form that we fill right it's not part of the conversation um whether we are having equal uh partnerships where both of us are learning versus often in the global south we're just data collectors um you know and at best you'll get a, a bit of a slot on the presentation or some slides um but you don't contribute to knowledge building you hardly contribute to theorizing in the field the voice is your your voice as a scholar is marginalized um and there are some i think the the colonial uh, dimension here is strongly reproduced and we have these guidelines that are sometimes very harmful although they call themselves do no harm i remember a study that we had to do uh, on um, Palestinian refugees in Lebanon, and we had lots of researchers from the community who were, you know, who were involved in this, and this was funded by a UN agency, 
and they had to do for us training or no harm. And one of the issues raised was violence. And, you know, what happens if a child reports violence or harassment? What do you do? Under do no harm, you can't do anything. Your priority is to protect the field for the next researcher. And that was, you know, it really created great difficulties among the researchers and um, us as kind of like mid or, uh, like, you know, like um, people who have had some experience, it really makes it an unethical responsibility for us. It's like we are, um, we're not providing answers for these researchers and we're not, uh, you know, we're not protecting them from the, you know, the, the mental health and the emotional burden that they are experiencing. Um, so this is, uh, and I think with partnership comes funding. And I think, um, Jane, you did mention funding, but but the criteria that we have for a lot of the funding, the eligibility criteria forces you to ask questions that are of interest to the audience in the Global North, not to the participants or the communities that we're working with. Um, I'll give you an example. If you want to apply for an ESRC grant, you cannot be the PI if you're from the Global South Institute. You have to find a PI from the Global South North and you have and automatically you are, you know, the power dynamics are not the same. Um, but the questions also, you have to collect your data in all, you know, ODA countries. What if you want to collect data, not from ODA countries, particularly with GCRF funds? So, you know, a lot of the funding shapes the kind of questions. And I think there are ethical implications for that kind of uh, funding criteria. The power dynamics that the eligibility criteria places um, on us, on, uh, you know, the question on impact, the question on dissemination, the question on, you know, we hardly think about how ethical are these things are and how much they're pushing us to do unethical practices. Um, um, and, and we're forced to build our careers from this, you know, from this whole experience. And I think sometimes, you know, we struggle of how are we exploiting what we're, you know, the, the populations we're working with and how, um, how much we can really bring back to the communities or what's our relationship with the community. Uh, and sometimes the funding does not allow us to do these um, type of research like action research, which would allow us to have a better, you know, like um, like a conversation and an open-ended conversation rather than an extractive kind of research. Um, issues of language uh, is, is a big, uh, you know, many of these uh, projects and partnerships don't take uh, the language of the local context. Events happen without being translated into the community where you, know, you invite them to the opening and the launch and you provide interpretation then, but you do not provide interpretation when you're presenting your findings or when you're publishing, because that's not a criteria of, uh, of um, you know, of, of making your career. It's not going to be a breaker for your progression. And I think these are ethical questions. The language of the knowledge we produce is, uh, is a very important one. Now, what we can do collectively, and I think this is um, one of the issues we have struggled a lot with, is how exclusive these networks have become and how elitist they have become. And that is unethical. Uh, and I think, you know, blame it on inflation still is un unethical. The fact that we had a conference that we wanted to go to uh, um, last year, it was on partnerships. And guess what? The fees were like almost 500 pounds. We presented, we, we had submitted abstracts, we could not attend. We could not even afford just the subscription, let alone traveling all the way, staying there. Um, so to what extent our networks are also ethical in terms of inclusion and exclusion, but also to what extent these networks are willing to challenge what has become a conventional reason, like this, how networks work and this, how conferences are and, and that's it. Um, but also, and, uh, and a colleague of mine, uh, Leila Katibal, criticizes also like the charity model built within these networks about around like apply for funding or apply for this, but we are applying, uh, offering some bursaries. And for some scholars in the global north or some communities, they cannot, they don't even appreciate that kind of, you know, particularly if they are senior in their career, they don't want to apply. They want to give opportunities to other scholars. So that charity model does not change the way we want to work around participation and inclusion in these networks. Um, I think these networks have a big responsibility and, and, and the good news is there's work that has already been done. Um, ISFM, for example, produced some guidelines on partnerships. Um, there's more and more work 
Uh, I think British Academy is trying to push again for equal copies uh, or PIs, so you don't have to, and they're insisting that uh, the academic in the global south would be an equivalent PI. Uh, so I think some of these practices and, and asking questions about this is very important. I hope I did not, um, oh, one last point is which I haven't, I don't think we answered to it, which is whistleblowing. When we have practices of, um, you know, unethical practices, when you feel like um, you're forced into unequal power dynamics, you're forced into, um, uh, or you're excluded because of your positions and you're too noisy or you're too, uh, uh, you know, uh, the uh, joy killer. Right? Isn't there's this? Uh, I can't remember now the na her name. Horizon. She became the joy killer because always, all the time, you're talking about how this, you know, exploitive the system is and unethical. And and I think people pay prices for these decisions that they make. And I think having a system, part of uh, also research ethics around whistleblowing. You know, how is the data being collected? Who's researching? Uh, sorry, who's you know who's using this data? Where is it going? All of these questions. Who's benefiting? Whose career is making it? and whose career hasn't been built part of this research is, is also another important thing. Thank you very much. Maha, thank you for all these really great and thought-provoking inputs. Um, difficult to summarize, so I'll just say a few words. I think really important that you mention uh, positionality in this discussion. I think we need to be much more upfront about our positionality and you come back to it a bit later when you talk about the elitist dimension of a lot of this work, you know, who is able to participate into this in this discussion and how can we um, broaden the input of our colleagues uh, into these really important discussions since this is something that we need to be thinking about and maybe something to think about how the sort of COVID moment has in some ways opened up some possibilities in terms of international connection through these uh, Zoom uh, gatherings. But the fact that my man couldn't join us is also something else. I mean, he, he also had a lot to talk, to say about this, uh, the openings, but the limitations of this uh, going online world and what it means for, for creating more international and more ethical um, sort of collective practices or community of practices. So these are really important issues. I really, I thought that the point you made around the, the institutional ethics framework that we have as being both so important in guiding our work and yet so limited, and we really need to do some work in, in shaking that. And you raise a lot of really interesting places where that needs to be uh, thought about. And I think we, we've been thinking about that also in the budget and many others are too. So I think it's really high time that we put this together. Also very interesting to think about where are the levers of change sort of in our institutions, but also beyond it. So you talked about the British Academy in terms of funding sources, but we can think also about, of course, of course, other funding sources, uh, journals. Um, and I think we need to use our collective Space, those of us who have reached because of a certain age of <laughs> positions of influence, you know, on journals or in these organizations to really to use this relative power that we have gained to try to try and make those changes. Um, but again, this needs to be done collectively. So thanks very much for, for raising all of these. Lots to think about and lots of also very practical um, spaces of action. I think we can we can we can move on together. So our last um, our last panelist is Professor Adriana Allen, who is Professor of Development Planning and Urban Sustainability at the Bartlett uh, Development Planning Unit at UCL, where she teaches and researches in the fields of development planning, socio-environmental justice, and feminist political ecology. Um, she has been Vice Dean International also, so I need to, to mention that, so she'll have lots to, to, to bring to the conversation. But really, her what I'd like her to bring to the table in particular is the um, the input uh, as in her current role as president of Habitat International Coalition. She's she's in that role since 2019, which is a global alliance of social movements, activists and support organization who fight for social justice, gender equality and environmental sustainability in defense of habitat related human rights. And I think it's really important when we think about ethics of international engagement also is who are we engaging with um, as our previous um, um, contributors have already highlighted. So I think Adriana will have a lot of very interesting inputs on this side. Um, 
and I see there is a short video um, that uh, we need to share on behalf of Adriana, but maybe you can tell us when we should put switch this on. Thank you. Sure, Barbara. Thank you very much uh, to you and to Julia for organizing this, this very important uh, conversation. Uh, not to be finished, but to keep, to just to kick off today. Uh, and also many, many thanks to all the previous panelists. Behind us, behind uh, Prof. Combe and myself, we have Lake Victoria. I wish we could share it with you. <laughs> uh, and, and we have a lovely sunny day as well. But we also have issues, speaking about the digital uh, divide, we have serious issues of connectivity, <laughs> even if we are in the best spot <laughs> that we could find. Yeah. So I might have to switch off the camera just to aid the, the conversation. It's, so apologies if I have to do it, that at any point. Probably I will have to. Um, so, so many things, many thoughts, many insights that I fully concur with. Um, what I want um, to do is to perhaps just give another spin to our conversation. So uh, I think that we have quite a clear and, and, and common uh, collectively shared diagnosis about you know, the, the, the multiple challenges we face uh, in really you know, endorsing, uh, practicing you know, um, ethics in uh, international management uh, beyond, very often, beyond our best will. Uh, and the, those clearly have to do with the po political economy of the institutions in which we work. I am here in Monza working with Prof. Combe and many more, but uh, I am based also at the VPU and my colleague of Barda. Um, but as I said before, what I want to do is, um, rather than going through the diagnosis, explore with you perhaps uh, the possibility of looking at uh, the practice of critical pedagogies as a way of counteracting many of the problems that we highlighted today. Um, and the story starts uh, here. Um, several years ago, uh, I had the pleasure, uh, together with Julia and also with colleagues from the, uh, Indian, uh, the uh, Indian Institute for Human Settlements, uh, based in Bangalore, uh, to lead one of the work packages of uh, a project that has been uh, uh, named several times, No Knowledge in Action for Urban Equality. And here, we were, what we were looking at were definitely at questions of ethical practice, but very much from the perspective of pedagogy. That, among many other explorations, took us to look at the pedagogies practiced by others, uh, where universities are one among many uh, pedagogues. Um, and this story is where we landed with HIC, with the Habitat International Coalition. So perhaps just two words so that you understand what HIC is. Um, Otherwise, the rest of the story might not make sense. Uh, HIC is, as Barbara said, a very broad-based coalition uh, constituted over 45 years ago um, uh, to work through advocacy, but also co-learning in the uh, defense of habitat rights, uh, not only housing and land, but uh, uh, at the beginning of the coalition, that was the, 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 the main purpose. Uh, HIC works across five continents, and is made of completely different types of institutions, social movements, grassroots organizations across these five continents, uh, uh, bodies like uh, technical bodies, uh, NGOs, uh, and also many universities and think tanks. And as I said before, when um, what took us to think or to do a collaborative exploration with HIC was the fact that we noticed that one of the key devices to advance habitat rights was the practice of critical pedagogies. So we embarked in a process with Julia of almost three years of collectively exploring and reflecting on a number of schools, HIC schools in Latin America. And they are typically called like that. They are called, they call themselves the schools. Uh, they do that with a very Freudian uh, orientation. Um, and these schools are schools of citizenship, schools of feminism, schools of community lawyers, schools of participatory design, and the list goes on. We work together with 10 schools across the whole of uh, Latin America, and through this process of collective reflection, we found five key capacities that were developed uh, through the practice of these critical uh, and popular pedagogies, um, which we think have a lot to do as well uh, with the practice of ethical relations in international engagement. 
the first practice um, uh, or capacity was the capacity to weave, the capacity, if you wish, uh, to interconnect different systems, different knowledge systems, uh, and to give value to them. A second key capacity was the capacity to think, feel, senti pensar, think, feel. And that was uh, the capacity to connect and respect uh, that knowledge and our, uh, our understanding of the world in which we live and what might change it, it don't only come, doesn't only come from uh, Cartesian understandings, yeah? it, it comes from different rationalities. Together uh, with that, the notion of feel think or sentipensar is also very important in reminding us or developing the capacity to care for each other and to care for others collectively. The third uh, capacity was the capacity uh, to mobilize. And here we were not talking about mobilizing resources, but mobilizing framings, mobilizing interpretations of the world, so that when I show in a school, I might come with my own positionality, I might come with my own framings, my own way of seeing the words embedded in whatever collectives you know uh, I work with. But when I leave the school, there has been mobility, yeah, in the, in, in that understanding. The fourth one is the capacity to rever reverberate, and. This is really important because one critical concern that obviously reappears again and again when we talk about international engagement is the possibility of transnational, translocal learning, if you wish. So how do we move? How do we move from uh, just, you know, I don't know, uh, treating uh, the possibility of learning across uh, popular uh, or grassroots groups as a localized exercise? How do we create constructive and productive discussions directly with people across Africa, Latin America, Asia, and of course, Europe and the rest of the world. So this idea of mobilizing was also very uh, resonating, so it was also very important. And the last one, of course, uh, not, uh, not to anyone's surprise, was the capacity to emancipate. That is the capacity to uh, not only to create better conditions for inclusion, better conditions for um, a redistribution, a more fair redistribution of resources, but very much the capacity to activate a political agency. And this is absolutely crucial in what we saw there. Now, I'm going to share with you these, these five principles and whole uh, process of collective reflection uh, gave way uh, to a number of outputs that were co-produced. I can see that uh, Julia is sharing them on the chat. And also a number of very interesting short videos uh, in which the schools told their own story in a very reflective way, not describing what they do, but really going to the core of how is that a critical pedagogy of co-learning works to activate political change and political agency. Now, um, we also work on a documentary. The documentary is a bit longer, 45 minutes, hasn't been released yet. So we will get back to all of you when uh, the launch comes. It's almost ready. We are just subtitling it. But what I want to do today is not to talk about uh, these uh, outcomes, uh, more than output, but uh, put on the table three reflections uh, or three insights perhaps for further discussion in the time we have together. And before I do that, I will be really grateful if you can share an app, it's just a very short clip from one of our collective conversations. This uh, clip comes from a pedagogue, Eduardo, who is based in, uh, at a university. So he's like many of you, like myself, wearing one of my hats, an academic, working at the Autonomous uh, uh, University of Mexico, who is deeply you know, embedded in processes in, in one of his schools uh, that uh, we explore together. So perhaps we can share the clip and, and then I just close with three remarks. Um, can you see? Um, yes. I just hope the sound works. Yes. Okay. Yes. Nosotros aquí tenemos que sostener la idea de que la universidad debe ser gratu gratuita y con expansión, con extensión hacia los sectores populares, eh, planteando la necesidad de un conocimiento que sea útil para los sectores populares. Estos procesos donde se vincule y que no se piense que la universidad es la que tiene todo el conocimiento y los que estudiaron tienen todo 
el conocimiento, sino que ellos pueden aportar una parte y la gente con su experiencia, etcétera, es riquísimo, ¿no? Yo sintetizaría esto con lo que dijo un compañero indígena que participó dentro del segundo diplomado de este nuevo diplomado de hábitat, territorio, democracia y buen vivir. Dijo, uy, a mí cuando me invitaron a la universidad yo sentí un miedo espantoso porque a mí me habían sacado de la escuela y le habían dicho a mis padres qué pena, pero el muchacho no es bueno para estudiar. Y cuando termina el diplomado dice, lo que más me gustó de este diplomado es que aprendí que puedo seguir estudiando, que puedo seguir aprendiendo, que no soy un bruto para aprender, que me gusta aprender, pero lo más importante de todo que yo tengo mucho que enseñar. Thank you. Uh, I hope you could you could hear and 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 read the subtitles. Um, I forgot to say that uh, one critical aspect is that these uh, critical pedagogies or, or the practice of these critical pedagogies through these schools and many more uh, that we, we could find through other you know, orga organizations and initiatives, in fact, uh, take us completely beyond the binary of teaching and learning. And this is why, for instance, we call everyone participating in the school is recognized as a pedagogue. We learn, yeah, we learn and we teach, like, uh, you know, and we enjoy both. Uh, a second thing that I mentioned as well, that I didn't mention, which is also important, is that these schools uh, change the learning environment. And what we found through these 10 schools uh, that we, uh, through which, you know, we, we produce a collective reflection was that the, actually the learning environment or the classroom was the body, was the neighborhood, was uh, the city, was the public space, it was of course the internet and the social media, and even the taxi. So this is also very important, the decentering of the space and reoccupation sometimes of the university with very different contents, with very different bodies, yeah, dressed as pedagogues, not as, uh, uh, not as, uh, as students. Um, now, the three things that I want to put on the table for discussion, because I'm aware that we have about 15 minutes and, and we do want some uh, space for everyone to, uh, to interact, um, are these. One thing that I take from Eduardo's reflection is a, a very important reminder about the social function of the university. And uh, I think that this is critical from the, for the discussion that we are having. This is critical for organizations like UCL, for organizations like the Bartlett, and uh, for the many reasons that many have highlighted in terms of a very biased political economy, a political economy that uh, creates uh, and produces and reproduces asymmetries. And this is something that we cannot uh, forget, that we have to actively you know, uh, uh, fight against. And the example or the, the, the process uh, that Shane shared with us is a very clear example of that. Um, the second one is that I think that uh, critical pedagogies in the body of these schools, in the format, in the, in the orientation of these schools, um, also offer and have a capacity to challenge asymmetric relationships. We talk a lot about different forms of asymmetry. Asymmetry in terms of regions, in terms of sites, in terms of learners, in terms of resources. And um, I always remember a very uh, interesting uh, story that uh, a very dear colleague with whom we collaborated uh, in this uh, in now uh, shared with us one day. Um, and he uh, he's from India, uh, Gautam Ban is from India, and he was doing his PhD in the United States. And he said that at the beginning of the process, he was one told from the United States with your eyes, from India, you give testimony. And this idea that the global south or any one position in the global south is there to give evidence, to provide data, to give testimony to the theorization of others, uh, particularly located, is of course something very important and something that is very much embodied in the, the movement, I would say, to decolonize the university, on which we in global universities uh, or, or North universities, uh, universities in the global North that call themselves global have a particular responsibility. The third point that I want to highlight 
has to do uh, with the last story that uh, Eduardo shared with us, the story of one of those pedagogues that discovered that although he had been removed from school very early yeah, in his life, he discovered through the participation of one of these schools that actually he didn't love learning, but he had a lot to teach, lot, lots to give to others. And this for me means that when we think about these critical pedagogies, and of course about the ethical questions that we encounter in um, international engagement, it is not enough to think about inclusion. Inclusion is a first consideration, if you wish. But we think we have to think about how through these encounters, how through these um, uh, engagements, we produce political uh, agency. And I think that this is really, really redistribution of resources, recognition of each other's uh, knowledge and understanding and contribution to a real and transformative construction of parity of participation, parity of political participation in the way we, we engage. Thank you very much. I'm going to stop here.